Well, I guess it's time. This might be a little bit of a controversial topic, but I played The Last of Us 2 last year, over a year after its initial release, and I, like many others, had some thoughts. And I, like many others, thought my perspective was valuable enough to turn into a script, an mp3 file, and eventually a video review, and I, like many others, was wrong. But still, if you're interested in hearing my review of The Last of Us 2, go right ahead, and beware, I might criticise some things about the game you really enjoyed. Please don't give me a hard time about it, and please don't tell me in length comments about how I sound like a little girl and I need to wait for my balls to drop before I can have opinions on games. I'm I'm a 26 year old woman, I don't know why it is such a topic of confusion. Anyway, I might also compliment some of the things you do like. There were a lot of things I enjoyed about this game and I want to talk about them so that'll come in due time. Anyway, before I begin I just wanted to preface this. If you like the video please give me a like, subscribe to me here on YouTube and maybe even leave a comment about your own experience with The Last of Us 2. I make video game content as often as I can and I aim to upload about three or four times per month, so if that appeals to you, please make sure you subscribe so that you never miss another upload from me. Furthermore, I streamed all of my Last of Us 2 experience over on Twitch, so follow me there if you'd like to see me try new games and grab more trophies in real time, most days 7pm UK time. So looking at my notes on this game, I feel like I can generally split my appreciation of The Last of Us 2 down the middle, with gameplay on the good side and story on the bad side, but with a few exceptions which I will cover when I get to them. As a result, I'm going to start from the the foundations of the game and work up to the non-essentials, to the icing on the C-sharp cake or whatever language they developed this game in. Anyway, we will start by covering the core mechanics of the game, then the peripheral mechanics of the game, accessibility, cheats, unlockables for example, then we'll talk about the story, factoring in the characters, world building, the game as a sequel to the original Last of Us and how it compared, and kind of finally the message. So buckle up. This will be a long one, but hopefully an interesting one. Without further ado, my review of The Last of Us Part 2, and yes, there will be major, major spoilers. Section 1. Mechanics. Relax, you will be relieved to know that I think the gameplay of The Last of Us 2 is top tier. It's definitely one of the best components of the game, all things considered, but that's not always a point in its favour. My favourite part of Pizza Hut Pizza is that super greasy crunch in the deep pan crust, but I'm hardly going to spend 18 quid on one just for that. That being said, the overall combat and traversal of The Last of Us has completely pushed the envelope of gameplay in terms of fluidity, accessibility, and most importantly, fun, which contrasts it harshly with the actual story, which is bleak and unrelatable. And it builds on the mechanics of the first game really naturally. There's no janky adjustment you have to make if you play the sequel immediately after the first, so you can just step right into it. It's hard to describe, but essentially Naughty Dog seems to have mastered flow. Not only seamless transitions between actions and animations, but also the tempo of those actions. Sprinting from cover to cover only to focus through a scope, fire, recoil, take cover again, hop over a ledge, swing a melee weapon, dodge away, hide, quickly craft. All of these actions are not only different animations, but different speeds the transitions between them varying from abrupt to quick to free and natural. Yet, in The Last of Us 2, it's not only extremely easy and smooth to perform these actions in quick succession, but fun as well. It's cathartic, satisfying, genuinely engaging. In some ways, it's not even the combat you're there for. It's the pleasure of performing this dance, almost. God, say, that made me feel like a dickhead. I'm sorry. Weirdly, I had to adapt to this level of ease. It's such a strange thing to say, but after playing games like Uncharted and GTA, I was really accustomed to angrily wrestling characters through a sequence of animation that I would often overclick buttons when coming to The Last of Us 2, meaning Ellie would spring around like a moron, usually into the welcoming arms of a bloater. <laughs> but we got there in the end. Once I was used to it, the game flowed so easily, but it felt strange to be getting wound up over a game playing too well. You see, this game has an aim mechanic that originally drove me into frustrated migraines. Similar to the first game, the aim of the aim mechanic, I guess, is realism. It wavers and floats and drifts, like I imagine a normal person's aim would. I'm no expert, so I can't say anything about real life gun skills with a grain of certainty, but at first, naturally, it's infuriating. I don't think I've played a game with wavering aim before. Sure, I've had games with bullet spread and bullet bloom and recoil and whatever other impediments developers want to drop on my skull, but never varying aim. And weirdly, I liked it. Sure, at first it outraged me, but after a while you really acclimate to it. There's a kind of sway you can rely on with The Last of Us 2's gunplay. As the crosshair drops down, it'll spring back up, and you can rely on that momentum to start to hit some really naughty shots, like learning piano with a metronome if pressing piano keys killed people at a great distance. After a while, you begin to pair it with flick shots 
shots and I promise there is no pleasure in life greater than hitting a naughty flick shot from 50 feet away. Once I'd put The Last of Us 2 down, I found myself getting frustrated with other games and their static aim. It felt so much harder to play with a steady aim than a moving one, like all of a sudden I had an absolutely still dot that I now had to babysit all the time to make sure it kept firmly in place, compared to a free moving, more independent puck that zoomed around the ice rink of my vision. Your crosshair in The Last of Us 2 is your colleague, not your baby. It's there to help you, not to be helped by you. The dodges are quick and effective, but they're bound to L1, which is a difficult adjustment to make. This is obviously a completely personal opinion, but I've always much preferred a circle dodge or X button dash, as L1 is a strange feeling button to have to tap when you need to tap it quickly. I feel like you tap the circular buttons on a controller, but you hold bumpers and triggers. It just feels more comfortable. As a result, I did love L1 for running. More games should do this. Melee attacks are useful in a pinch, but sit in a weird grey area between stealth melee and ranged fire. If you're in close enough quarters, you probably want to be using stealth, and straight melee attacks don't often one-hit kill the victim, so to me, it felt less effective. But obviously I can't speak for everybody. Melee weapons are found all around the in-game world in a way I appreciated and like the implementation of. Pipes are naturally jutting out of walls, and wrenches are tucked away in garages. All of the looting in the game is good. Like, in the first, the game is full of small drawers to open and boxes to search and cubbies to crawl into to find extra bits and pieces. You find stuff naturally, in small amounts, and there's no vendor that pops up along the journey to pad your pockets. Got something that might interest you. <laughs> You find what you find, and that's what you work with. There are a lot of collectibles in this game, which is something I've heard complained about, but I didn't mind them myself, oddly. Perhaps it was because I didn't run through the game in one go, but spliced it amongst other games I was playing at the time, that maybe gave me a little bit of extra stamina for finding the collectibles, or whether I've not played many games with collectibles, or whether it is quite an exploration-focused game, but whatever the reason was, it wasn't overflow for me. It has roughly the same density of collectibles as Doom Eternal, but that game really wound me up with how much stopping and starting I had to do to make sure I had everything as I went, so I personally feel like it just depends on the genre and the pacing of the game. It's annoying in a fast paced game like Doom, but it's alright in a slower game like The Last of Us 2. I also appreciate the way, as with the first game, lootables are limited depending on the difficulty you play on. Grounded mode really does feel grounded in the most literal sense of the word. Loot is sparse, crafting is a careful consideration, and going out of your way for extra items can often backfire if you spend more than you find just fighting your way out of the situation again. One issue I did have with grounded mode, and this is a weird one, it might have just been pure coincidence, so let me know if you had anything similar or anything different, but it is the only difficulty mode I ever saw any bugs in. It was strange, it was absolutely bug free for the first three playthroughs I did, but I don't know if it was a damage related momentum thing or what, but the enemies in grounded very frequently twatted me so hard that I would fall through the floor of the map. I remember several times during Abby's fight with the Rat King, he would whack me into the fifth dimension and I would just fall into a big black pit below the floor. It never really bothered me, thankfully, since the hit would kill me anyway, floor clipping or not, so it ended up being a lot of comic relief during some of the harder sections when I'd just get twatted into the abyss, but I thought it was worth mentioning at least. It wasn't an issue, but it was just something I noticed. Besides that, grounded mode really does feel like the game was intended to be played. Limited items, as limited as items would be 25 years after an apocalypse, plus devastating enemy damage make for savage encounters, where you either carefully battle your way through a group or trial and error your way through them in stealth, figuring out their cues and patrol patterns to isolate them and pick them off one by one is really rewarding. In fact, the combat encounters truly are the highlight of this game, which makes it such a shame that they are so few and far between, comparative to the length of the game time. One of the things this game really suffers from, besides a deplorable story, but we'll get to that later, is padding. This game is absolutely rife with padding. There are volleys of cutscenes, but more annoyingly, cutscenes disguised as walking sections where you fat walk in one direction, just pushing forward on the stick whilst characters talk to each other. I promise. Wait, this is just me 
else, and there's no way to move it on or make it go any faster. In my opinion, if I am just holding forward and listening to two characters speak with no further input from me, it's basically a cutscene, and therefore, let me skip it, or at least speed it up by running ahead. I did four playthroughs of The Last of Us 2, and there were so many moments of exposition that I just didn't need from my second playthrough onwards, and I ended up getting really frustrated with it. Yes, the exposition is interesting and important on a first run through, but fat walk exposition dumps easily take up about 30% of the game, and I would love to be able to pick and choose what I need to hear. Moreover, I think forced fat walk sections really ruin the speedrun potential of games. I think it's best shown by the Uncharted series, which all have speedrun trophies per instalment. 1, 2, and 3 ask you to finish roughly 10 hour games in 2.5 hours, 3.5 hours, and 4 hours respectively, but Uncharted 4, a game you can beat in about 11 hours, has a 6 hour speedrun trophy, and I attribute that entirely to the sheer amount of unskippable fat walking and talking you do. It makes it so hard to build good strats because you're strapped down into another 8 minutes of forced exposition every few scenes, and it drags the game to an absolute halt, splicing up the fun platforming, exploration, and combat, and just sitting you on a rail track and making you wait an arbitrary amount of time until you can move at walking speed again. A lot of people have said that the story goes on a bit too long, and a lot of these criticisms centre around there being a third act, which kind of clings on like a vestigial limb. Like how everybody had been to school with the proud owner of a third nipple, it just seems like a weird extra bit of something that shouldn't be there. I don't strictly agree with that. I think that the game goes on too long because of all the unskippable walking and talking, which forces areas to bloat well beyond what's reasonable, meaning some aspects of the game that should be about 5 minutes long go on for almost 30. The pacing is wild, and I'll get to it soon, but besides being annoying and shit to constantly be swapping between a slow crawl and a weird limp, the mad pacing serves to split up the fun gameplay even more. When the game is allowed to shine, it does, but it's so desperate to cart you about for hour after hour, so you're always waiting ages for the next interesting moment. In fact, speaking of the final section being a bit of a vestigial limb, there are a few gameplay mechanics I felt were added in right at the end that were very underdeveloped. For example, when infiltrating the Rattlers in the final chapter, the resort, you find infected wearing collars being used as guard dogs. This is a really cool concept, and you see it for the first time here in a 14 hour story, right at the absolute end of the game, literally the final half an hour. Why not introduce it early on? In fact, why not have the Rattlers featured earlier in the game? Just like the infected guard dog mechanic, there's a lot of undercooked stuff in this game, but story wise we'll get there. The infected are basically an environmental hazard by this point, of which, not counting the Rat King as he's a unique enemy, they only introduce one new type, the Shamblers. Shamblers is a weird name considering they are very good at running and exploding, so I was thinking perhaps Bombi might be a better one, but we'll think about it. They're a fairly familiar zombie type, being that most pieces of zombie media do have an exploding zombie, but I love the way that they developed because of the excessive rainfall, causing their infection to manifest as acidic pustules all over their body. I remember Druckmann really proudly explaining this concept in a few interviews, that the cordyceps infection would develop depending on which region you're in and the kind of environmental factors that would impact your body as it developed through the stages of the infection. Touting a mechanic Pokemon had down pat years ago, except, oh wait, you find them in Santa Barbara too for some reason. Like, in the sun, where it would be dry and hot. Oh well, world building gone I suppose, I guess they couldn't resist. The Stalkers get much more of a debut in this game as well, to the point where a lot of people think that they first showed up in The Last of Us 2, but they actually featured very briefly in the first game, firstly in the basement of the Pittsburgh Hotel, and secondly in some sewer level, so they were fairly underutilised in the first game and it was good to see them again here. They used much more in The Last of Us 2, and not in a weird inorganic way either, like the Shamblers. They haunt crowded dark rooms with lots of nooks and crannies, and make for super interesting stealth sections that you can absolutely sprint through if you reach the QTE doors fast enough. While the core mechanics of the game are mostly consistent quality, the peripheral mechanics are more hit and miss, depending on how much attention they were given in their development. Some features are well adjusted, but some of them come with some crazy daddy issues. Ellie's wire puzzles? Daddy issues. They used it a couple times throughout her section, but hardly developed beyond find somewhere to swing on this, find somewhere to throw this, but then they get abandoned in the latter two thirds of the game. Ellie's sniper tutorial? Daddy issues. It's the only part of the game where the bullets have drop off, and sure it is cool, but you never ever need to shoot any enemies in the game from the same distance you learn with Tommy. Especially for a section that has about 20 minutes of conversation, it is rendered a huge waste by mere virtue of the fact that the design team just fucking forget it exists. Random open world exploration section? Daddy issues. There's only one section in the game, it's full of buildings, but as I said before, the speedrun potential is crippled, especially here, where the gasoline you're fetching will always be in the second place you look, meaning you can't learn the game and be rewarded with saved time on future playthroughs. These buildings are just rooms with collectibles and notes, so if you're all about exploration, this is an ideal place, but it's so 
hollow. The bank is interesting at least, basically a wrong place wrong time scenario for a group of bank robbers who decided to hop on that Sigma grind set on day one of the outbreak and consequently got locked in a vault and left to die. It's a cool bit of exposition, but it didn't need to be an open world to be successful, I'd have enjoyed it just as much on a linear path. Also, this random open world area takes the pacing out the back of the shed and puts it down. You go from a cohesive story to just two hours of dawdling in a section of game that adds so little that after the first playthrough I'd just run through it as fast as I was allowed to. Rattler infected guard dogs? Daddy issues. A brilliant concept only introduced right at the end when most less impressed players will either have given up and moved on to another game or emotionally checked out, meaning that the impact is lost and there's no space to grow the concept, perhaps to a chained bloater boss that you have to loop around and tangle on objects. Swimming? Well adjusted. It's certainly alright, it plays similar to Uncharted games, not used loads but not overused either. Like the game hardly has you dragged off to the water temple 8 hours in and forced into awkward 3D traversal with nasty camera controls. It's like self-confidence, you know, it comes and goes and sticks around just short of being useful. Gun crafting animations? Well adjusted. Something they didn't need to add at all but they did and it's excellent. Watching our main two characters carefully work their way around firearms, delicately replacing parts, cleaning nozzles and closely examining items. Accessibility options? Options. Well adjusted, brilliant even. But I mean, I don't strictly need them, so I'm not the authority on this by any means, but having direction arrows point you along the path is very useful on future playthroughs when you want to rush through to your favourite bits or when you're doing collectible cleanup and want to get through efficiently. There's options that allow you to stay undetected as long as you're crawling, options that improve or worsen enemy AI, options that make stealth easier and harder. I like that to be honest. It's optional and if you're looking to ease yourself into permadeath and grounded mode slowly, you can make the best of these options to acclimate yourself if you're intimidated by taking the whole thing head on. Abby's bow shooting minigame, well adjusted. A surprisingly subtle introduction into how bows work within the game, how to account for distance and time, and how to make the most of pulling the arrow taut for the straightest shots. The guitar minigames, daddy issues. Really cool the first time you do it and if you actually know how to play guitar you can play your own tunes, which is sound. But it gets repetitive fast. There's a narrative reason for that repetition but it counts as a puzzle, so I skipped them after my first playthrough. Fuck it. Speaking of daddy issues, our story is split into three acts. Ellie, Abby and the finale. Ellie and Abby each get three whole days of video game to tell you about themselves and see if maybe you can fix the problems they've either caused or exacerbated. And then when that all fails you have the finale to finally set things straight, or in Ellie's case, lesbian. So I have a lot of feelings about this story and I feel like some of the more irritating parts of this story have their source in earlier moments. So as such I'll summarise the game chapter by chapter and cover it chronologically across all six days and then the finale, so let's go. The game begins us with Joel riding horseback to the town of Jackson narrating the events of The Last of Us Part 1, which is a generous move considering the first game came out 50,000 years ago so you're more than welcome to forget the specifics. The introduction chapters are boring as fuck to be blunt, but it's at least nice sitting us behind a familiar face and helping us recline back into the story. But then we wake up as Ellie in a trend I would soon come to find mentally exhausting and not in a way the game intended. She gets up, gets dressed and answers the door to precious chicken Jesse, who on one hand is unbelievably sweet and on the other hand irritatingly forgetful. Giving. The summary of the situation is that Jesse and his girlfriend Dina broke up recently and Ellie immediately swooped in for some sloppy seconds, or Dina immediately swooped out for Ellie publicly in front of everybody they knew and before the dust had even settled on their relationship she was on it with somebody else. Wildly, Jesse has no beef. I'm not saying that he should hate Ellie or Dina, it's their lives after all, but personally I would feel a little bit fucked off if I was in his shoes. I think it would be impossible to find immediate forgiveness and closure in Jesse's situation, no matter how hard you try to be reasonable, I feel like there's always something that would sting, some wounds that would need to heal, but they've characterised him as a complete doormat so he just doesn't seem to mind. I've had a couple of relationships in my time and even ones I ended myself I would probably be a bit surprised to see them immediately go out and find somebody else, but from what we hear, Dina seems to have been the one who broke up with Jesse and then she immediately moved on, so I feel like that would hurt him to feel like you'd been dumped for somebody else, so I don't know. Just it didn't come off very naturally, almost like they wanted to characterise him as a very lovely precious character that you'd want to take care of, like a character you'd be sad to see die suddenly. Even nice people can have hurt feelings, I don't know, go figure. Jesse greets Ellie with this benevolent warm smile and they immediately go about their lives in a scene that feels like it goes on forever. A really strange angle the game takes here is having Ellie walk into a pub and suddenly be greeted with an apology by a man who made homophobic comments towards her and Dina the night before. In a way that we'll learn more about more later, he was stopped in his tracks when he was making comments to Ellie and Dina 
And now he's being made to apologise, and as a gesture of good faith, he gives Ellie a sandwich he's made. It's a very strange theme to suddenly bring up, particularly in the opening moments of the game, as, spoiler alert, it sets up nothing. This man never appears in the story again, besides one flashback cutscene later that is more for characterising Joel than it is for fleshing out Ellie's story, and the themes of homophobia don't show up again in the narrative. There's no danger here, no stakes, it happens in the course of one cutscene over a few minutes, sets nothing up, pays nothing off, highlights none of the themes of the game that we're going to be going through. No one cares, rightly, that Ellie and Dina are together, it never comes up in conversation again, it's never used against them, it's never the source of any animosity towards them, it literally just features here, now. Is it a reason why they don't return to Jackson later on? Maybe. But no one really makes mention of this afterwards, it's not relevant to Ellie or Joel, nor Ellie and Abby, nor Abby and Lev, so it ends up coming off as smug, the writers showing us how little they tolerate homophobic behaviour, more as a way for them to look us right in the eye and go, we're moral. Like, there's nothing in the message here I disagree with, but it just bewilders me as to why they put it front and centre in a plot that doesn't focus on homophobia in any capacity. There's nothing revolutionary about making a statement to say you dislike bigots. The guy may as well have gone on a flat earth tirade to muted reception and it would have had the same impact on the story. Ellie refers to him as a bigot sandwich and the game treats it like a huge one up. What are you? and I tried to latch on to whatever story I was being fed in vain. Afterwards we take on some tutorials, such as the snowball fight against some kids, one of which was an absolute jumbo shithead, and head out into some more tutorials. At some point we switch to Abby too, where she's brought all of her friends on some mysterious quest. I wonder how far through the game we'll have to go before we can learn more about it. She has tutorials too. There's a lot of tutorials. The main gripe here is that there is a really long sequence of back and forth in this area. Sure, the snow is pretty and it's one of the most visually unique areas in the game, but I can't help but feel that the tutorial could have been spliced in later during the actual gameplay. I mean, some of it is. Like, the explosion tutorials don't really kick in until about hour four, but man, it's just padding. It just feels really slow. You discover clickers here for the first time, and I already felt that they were a little bit underwhelming compared to their initial counterparts, but I couldn't really put a finger on why. They're just as rare and just as dangerous, and the game adds this brilliant clicker bark thing they do, where they like shout noise at you and they can see you even if you're stood still, which is a terrifying touch and one I really appreciated. There are tutorials here on crafting and stealthing and looting, and it's all very basic. It's strange. The tutorials all blend into the gameplay very well, but the gameplay so obviously stands out against the backdrop as it's just a sandbox for tutorials that it's really obviously a time waste before the actual story starts, so it becomes frustrating, especially on later playthroughs. I guess they can't front load the story into cutscenes and I understand why they chose to put gameplay first for a few hours, so there's actually some emotional impact later down the line, but still, it comes off clunky and bookended. I'm sure there are better ways to have done this. As Dina and Ellie settle down for a long-awaited shag, we shunt ourselves over to the scene this game is known for. Go fucking get up! Please stop! So, you know, spoilers, but Joel dies. It's a bold choice, definitely. Big shock value, big sad, and a big sticking point for a lot of players. Definitely bold, considering they want you to like Abby later, but in my opinion, they crippled themselves here because they killed the most interesting character in the game, and then just kind of left a vacuum no other character could fill. I mean, who comes close? Jesse's a smiley face badge. Tommy's MIA the whole story. Nina starts to shine, I suppose, but once she admits she's poggers, she sits out the rest of the game. So they kill a huge character, probably for the sake of breaking some ground, but they don't really do anything with his absence. You could say it's intentional, like it's a metaphor for grief never quite having that hole filled, but it's also boring. All the characters end up being disparate meteors without a sun to orbit. Neither Abby nor Ellie ever fill the void, and I patiently wait for the story to be interesting. Intentional or not, it takes the legs out from under the story right at the start and lands it hard on its arse. This is definitely the peak of the story too, this huge moment of horror, and the rest of the game just trickles on afterwards with little direction like it's trudging home in a pair of shit pants. People chasing other people, characters popping up and snuffing out like candles, few connections or relationships forged or explored, like a drunk walk home after a disastrous night out. One to remember, sure, but more for the fact that you saw your aunt get divorced after three glasses of wine and not because it was a bit cold on the way home. I'm not even necessarily against the fact that they killed Joel either. I think done right it could have been a heartbreaking and so impactful twist, but it ended up being a pathetic way to reignite a sad fire that died out years ago, with no new 
kindling to contribute, so it just weakly flickers on the embers until it fizzles out for good, and then the game goes on for 10 more hours. Oddly, I felt like one of the strongest parts of the game quickly followed the weakest part of the series. It's only a small moment, but Ellie grieves, and it's very genuine. There's an optional scene you can find if you take Ellie to Joel's closet, where she hugs his coat hard and inhales his smell, and it is unusually real and touching. Paired with better built-up deaths and more organic casts of characters, I would have been ugly crying at this point. This game is probably one of the only moments she feels like the Ellie we know from the previous game, particularly if you played the first just before the second to refresh your memory, this moment will stick out. She leaves his house and you can see that his house is overlooking hers, like a father over a daughter. In some ways, bittersweet. Especially after he's passed, he's still watching over her. In other ways, cringe. I'll cover it later, but Joel is a battered dog in this game. We'll get to it, but I guess touches like these were stained for me by the ham-fisted execution, literally. After like two conversations, Ellie decides to head across the country for revenge. For me, and from what I've seen of the way other people engaged with this story, this seems to be the point of the game where you're either invested or you're not, and if you're not invested in Ellie's story here, you probably never will be. This plot point, Ellie actively deciding to go on a journey to enact violent revenge on someone else, definitely seems to be the fork in the road for a lot of players. On one half of the line, you'll have people who back Ellie, probably the kind of people who think they'd be a wolf if they were an animal. Reality check, you apple. There are more animals than just wolves, you'd probably be a donkey or a budgie or a Mediterranean spur-thighed tortoise. On the other half are people who just don't see the point in revenge. Abby was a huge saddo, spending several years trying to get a chance to bump off Joel. Two wrongs don't really make a right, and it is a lot of effort to go cross-country just to kill somebody who went cross-country just to kill you, at the age of 19, surviving rough and going through god knows what just to kill somebody who wronged them. I think it's easy to see Ellie's actions through the framing of the game, i.e. a bunch of scenes with loading screens between them, but think about it. She crosses whole states. This story spans the course of years. Firstly, between Jackson and Seattle. You can tell because Mel admits her pregnancy to Owen in the first scene, and she's around nine months pregnant by the time you see her again. And then there's another year or two until Dina and Ellie arrive on the farm, because obviously their baby is more than a year old by that point, and then God knows how long to get to Santa Barbara or back. That is a long time travelling hundreds of miles through a dangerous world just to get revenge. That is a life consumed by revenge. And I don't think a lot of people understand understand the quantity of hours, days and weeks that they have spent consumed by revenge. I don't know, it just didn't seem something I could relate to. I was in the second camp, if you can't tell, and I just didn't back Ellie. As a result, her story began to fall very flat for me. I started to discover a lot of quick time events that wouldn't let me pass until I actively murdered innocent people, or would kill me and make me retry until I did it. It started to feel contrived for me, and a smug hand holdy look at what you did, despite the fact that I wanted to finish a game I'd been given as a gift and had long since emotionally checked out. Of. We had a fairly even split in Twitch chat if I remember correctly, so I know a lot of people do side with Ellie, but personally I just never agreed with her actions or motives. So I feel like half of the audience went along with this willingly and enthusiastically and really enjoyed the game, and the other half awkwardly went along because they paid money for the experience and kind of wanted to see how it ended. And this is a long game to not have half of your audience on side. Ellie's day one begins with her approach to Seattle, where most of the story will take place. This chapter is relevantly called The Gate, as said gate needs to be pass through for Ellie and Dina to continue on their journey. This requires a bunch of cord throwing, a ton of key codes, and a hell of a lot of fuel. Overall, the central conflict of this chapter, the aforementioned gate, is a solid foundation for this gameplay segment. It's concise. Ellie and Dina need to move forward, but they are blocked by a gate and they need to get around it. I like stuff like that. Simple problems presented by the story with simple solutions that are solved through gameplay. There are a few things I liked about this and a few changes I would have liked to see, but the game's out now and I can't expect a rehaul. But either way, I like that the game has a semi puzzle sequence here. You need to throw wires over fences and through windows to open up different areas on the path, and find scraps of paper with key codes on to get through big heavy doors. The setting here is really interesting too. Seattle is, or was I guess, an extremely militarised zone, fortified as fuck, with tall walls and huge heavy doors, military equipment, vans, cars, artillery, ancient corpses littered around in riot gear and visors. Notes scattered around the map tell an interesting story of martial law and sabotage, certainly a more interesting story than we're playing. A lot of areas in this game do that, tell an amazing story that I'd have loved to have played instead. The Last of Us Part 2 is, and I know this sounds redundant to say, so 
please bear with me. It's just The Last of Us 2. Like, it's just a continuation of The Last of Us. I know it sounds stupid and some of you will be laughing at me here, but The Last of Us 2 doesn't tell a new story in a, in a way. It just tells a continuation of the first story, drags it out well longer than it needs to be. It's not a self-contained piece of media that is set after the first game, it is just a tacked on epilogue that lasts 14 whole hours. But there are moments in this game that I would have loved to have seen more of. Premises that if they were fleshed out would have been so much more interesting. Seattle is one of them. I bet you could have written something great here. I'll point the others out as I see them, but I hope you know what I mean. The game suddenly flips open world and the pace drops through the floor. You spend a while looking for fuel, finally found it, and head through the gate. We find a hotel and slightly later an elementary school and this is our first experience with WLF, the Wolves, a kind of rival faction by virtue of being Abby's faction, but not really. Like, they shoot first, I think, but Ellie only kills them because Abby killed Joel, but she'd probably act out of self-defense anyway if she was facing death and they were attacking her, but why would they attack her? Why wouldn't they leave her alone? The logic behind the conflict is really shaky here, and yet another reason I couldn't get behind Ellie, nor really anybody in the game, because I had no fucking clue what anyone was even trying to achieve or why. They just shoot at each other in a way completely ignorant of self-preservation. I can understand empathy devoid, but I feel like picking your battles is just as important in a world with mineral supplies and medical care as it is winning them. There's a lot of very shaky judgement here actually. Dina, knowing she's pregnant, hops along with Ellie on her journey without telling her, and then by the second day she's already too pregnant to help anymore and she has to sit out the rest of the game. Throughout Ellie's days in Seattle, we're going to come to understand that her gameplay segments have an asinine copy-paste formula to them. She'll get her objective, for example, to find one of the people who attacked Joel in the TV station, she'll head over to the TV station, there's some walking, some talking, some exploring, you platform in, there's a stealth segment, you achieve your objective, and then intense music starts and you have to run out. It's that weird, like, inception drone that everything seems to be doing nowadays. It happens in the tunnels with the run out of the subway to the theatre, it happens at Hillcrest, it happens in the hospital, it happens everywhere. And it is too overused to be impactful, and after a while you can predict it. Another thing that becomes wearily predictable is how the game kills off a character every time it wants to move the story along location-wise. First, obviously, is the lesser known side character Joel Miller, whose death has you move from Jackson to Seattle. Second is the horse, which marks the transition between the open world area and the elementary school. Then we've got Nora at the end of the hospital with a smash head in QTE that I honestly tried to wait out because I genuinely didn't see the point in beating a woman to find jelly. Then we've got Mel and Owen, and finally Jesse marks our transition to Abby's segment of gameplay. Also, they name their baby after him, which is fucking weird, and if I was him I would approach that with one eyebrow raised, but he's dead so I guess he can't. Then with Abby, we've got Lev's sister, then Manny, then Mel and Owen again, I suppose. Characters aren't characters in the world or story as much as they are just point scoring for loss, denoted by an abrupt cutscene in the middle of a moment of action. It's weird because as I was playing The Last of Us Part 1, I noticed that this game kind of does that as well. Sarah ends the prologue, Tess marks the transition between the quarantine zone and the sewers, the outside world, Henry and Sam the transition between summer and fall, but all these people were built up to be imperfect but brilliant characters and their deaths are impactful despite their flaws. Sarah's a plucky tomboyish character who we see mirror in Ellie, the last shrapnel piece of Joel's memory of the pre-apocalypse world, something he can barely talk about, but a vestige he nurtures in Ellie who acts as her parallel. Tess is Joel's partner, she's extremely tough, unforgiving, battle-hardened, but clever and snide, with a good sense of humour and a respectable sense of duty. She is the one who encourages Joel forwards on the quest, him initially sceptical about Ellie's adventure because she wants a better world and she sacrifices herself to allow it. Henry leaves you in the face of danger to keep his brother Sam safe because he loves him so much, but he's a strict and at times neurotic caretaker, keeping Sam harshly in line, stopping him from collecting new toys and having too much fun. You can understand why he does it and you can't really blame him for the actions he takes, he's just another survivor, doing their thing and trying to just get by. When Sam's bitten and turns, Henry kills him and, overcome with grief, kills himself. But then we look at The Last of Us 2, where Jesse's just a doormat who gets shot in the head after a bunch of lukewarm appearances where he drives zero plot and inoffensively aligns with everything Ellie wants. For Abby, Manny is a womanizer who gets shot in the head after a bunch of lukewarm appearances where he drives zero plot and inoffensively aligns with everything Abby wants. Mel and Owen are our closest things to fleshed out proper characters but neither of them push the plot or drive any character's motivation besides Abby's need for revenge, they're just entities she whacks against during her own story. And like I said, if revenge doesn't personally appeal to you, there's nothing there for you emotionally as the player. Mel could be a reflection of Abby's potential life had she not become consumed with revenge and broken up with Owen for the sake of her obsession, but if that's the case, I think 
think it would have been a better reflection if Mel had stayed alive and thrived, to really show Abby the life she sacrificed just so she could avenge her father's death. Outside of these insta-kill cutscenes, there's not a lot of violence at all. I felt like a bit of an edgelord for saying that, but hear me out. I remember in the first game getting caught by an enemy meant a gory, nasty death, especially the bloaters, which were borderline traumatising. I think my copy of Elden Rings just arrived. Ah. But the trauma was good, in a way, because it meant the scenes were so horrible that you took extra attempts to avoid them. They're scary. Your body flares up the adrenaline and the pistons start pumping and you get a bit squeaky and a bit panicked. It's all part of the process. It adds stakes to areas beyond just reloading and retrying. Joel's bloater death cutscene haunts me to this day. In The Last of Us 2, bloaters just kind of fumble you a bit. It's a far more PG death for a title that spawned the Joel in one meme. Ellie's journey takes you through a variety of areas, my favourite being the tunnels, but I did didn't find any of them too memorable. There are moments here and there of course, the execution display in the TV station, the quarantined area under the hotel, the main room of the aquarium, but largely we've just got an overgrown city, overgrown street, overgrown house, flooded city, flooded street, flooded house, old ransacked buildings, old ransacked sheds, old ransacked factories. My favourite piece of accidental world building in The Last of Us 2 is that in the first game you run through all sorts of houses with all sorts of rooms, old bits and pieces, televisions, appliances, dartboards, but in the second game, loads of houses suddenly have PlayStation 3 consoles. From this, we can interpret that PlayStation 3s were in production during the initial outbreak and either sold to survivors or simply placed in lots of abandoned houses, like Santa just didn't really get the memo. Visually, the game doesn't pick up until Abby's half of the game, but I'll be sure to give it plenty of credit when we get there, because I actually love the scenes we see as Abby, despite their bleakness. The Last of Us 2 definitely goes for a much darker, much bleaker setting than the first, which is a shame, because the first had so many beautiful moments. The first Last of Us is a very vibrant game in a lot of ways. Nights are deep blues, Grass is bright, rich greens, sunrises are soft peach colours, crumbled buildings are cluttered with old shards of mosaic art. There are so many striking scenes, the leaning buildings at the beginning, the algae soaked capital building, the sniper run in the cul-de-sac, the bells in the blizzard, there are so many memorable, beautiful moments. The Last of Us 2 is muted, more rain soaked. It was a shame to see a quieter visual design. I know it was intentionally drab, but I still thought it was a shame that, unlike the first game, it didn't make the effort to find moments of beauty in a world nature has aggressively reclaimed. There were some scenes, such as the flooded supermarket and the open world section, that I felt could have really benefited from some borderline unrealistic aesthetics. Some real moments of wow, like huge trees growing through buildings or colourful foliage. Like if the flooded supermarket was full of lily pads or something, I just felt like opportunities were missed. I don't know if lily pads are indigenous to Seattle, but neither is man targeting cordycep fungus, so anything's possible, especially plant-wise, and this was a chance I felt to really show a beautiful side to the apocalypse. There was a moment near the end of Ellie's section where she's on a boat heading out into the ocean, rolling waves almost causing her to tip overboard. The night is black above her and the sea is glistening pitch like waves of oil. It was visually impressive, but for some reason it was this scene that just made me think, I wonder how many devs didn't see their kids on Christmas for the sake of this moment, and then I just felt a bit guilty. Anyway, the final scene of Ellie's story, or at least her initial third of the game, exemplifies my biggest issue with this title, just how contrived it was. So for those of you who've not played the game and just have this on as background noise, or because they want to reaffirm their prejudice against the game, or are waiting to see if I'll do a transphobia, or all of the above. My biggest issue with The Last of Us 2 is that it sits you down, forces you to do something horrible, and then points a finger at you and tells you how horrible you are. It is time to talk about Mel. Mel's a character we'll eventually see fleshed out in Abby's arc. She's a heavily, heavily pregnant woman, like nine months, who insists on going out to help in some field work, despite, again, being heavily poggers. She wears tight-fitting clothes, long-sleeved t-shirts with a visible baby bump, She's a planet. She is dressed like this in every scene Abby sees her in. But when Ellie sees her, she's got a duffel coat on. <laughs> Like a huge fuck off Michelin man floor length cloak, the puffiest puffer coat ever created, just puffy enough that it completely obscures her baby bump, despite the fact that she's the shape of a lollipop. You wouldn't have a clue that she was prop hunt under all those clothes. So when Ellie attacks both her and Owen and holds them at gunpoint, neither of them say, hey, this is Mel, she's very pregnant right now, please don't kill her. None of them say a word, and I feel like even if not for your own safety, your parental hormones are going to kick in and you'll 
want to protect the life that's about to come spilling out of you like a popped beanbag. But no, nobody says a word, and what's worse, Mel physically attacks Ellie, like hand-to-hand -hand combat. The medic of the team, a woman who is portrayed as very clever, very measured, leaps onto an armed attacker and tries to grapple the gun out of their hand. Just the hurdles we have to leap over for all of these planets to align, for Ellie to act in self-defense in a QTE that if you don't press the button you die and have to reload and do it again until you do kill her. And then Ellie sits back and sobs and the game looks at you and tells you what a heartless bitch you are. Tell me where Abby is. How the fuck is she? Like it didn't just hold the rest of the story hostage until you behaved like a good little player and killed the pregnant lady. Mel is here to serve two purposes in Ellie's story. A, she is proof that Ellie will kill without asking questions, and B, she is a parallel to Dina, who may also be killed at any moment by somebody who also does not ask questions. But like, think about this for two seconds. There are so many women in the game that you just kill without a word. They might be pregnant too and you don't know them either. So why is Ellie particularly sad about this one? Why does she give a shit? The main problem with Mel however for me was that she cast kind of a nasty light on the first Last of Us game. Yeah, I said it. The original Last of Us is not free of criticism here, because the more I look at The Last of Us 2 and the more I say about how it forced you into situations where committing atrocities was the only way to further the game, the more I realise that it would be hypocritical to complain about it after the first instalment had probably the most grievous example of this I've ever seen. It was the final set piece of The Last of Us 1 actually, because you see the situation that Joel finds himself in at the crescendo of The Last of Us 1 is just as contrived as Mel's death. Although Ellie says herself that she would be willing to give her life to provide a cure, she's never actually given that respect by the Fireflies. They take her, put her under, and then tell Joel that they're going to kill her, or at least that she is going to die as a result of what they do to her. And the more I think about it, the more I struggle to kind of put the pieces together in my mind. Why would they not ask Ellie's consent before she goes under? Why would they then tell Joel, after Ellie is under, that she is about to die without her informed consent? Why wouldn't they wait until after the surgery is done to tell him. If they were going to lie to her, why didn't they lie to him? Why didn't they just let her die and then say it was an accident? As with The Last of Us 2, the first game is contrived just as badly to twist you into a situation where not only do you commit atrocities, but you're also somehow acting in self-defense as well. So both of them are bullshit to be clear, but the situation was different enough. In The Last of Us 1, you've got context on your side. Ellie is a defenseless girl who is about to die in her sleep, who has saved your life and been your only companion for the entire game. You've taught her how to survive and survived alongside her. She has become your daughter. The situation might be a load of shit that would never happen that way, but the emotional connection is enough that you want to do something to prevent her fate no matter how silly it is. This feeling is never recaptured despite the contrived situations in The Last of Us 2. In the first game, sure, I can tell you Joel's a rampaging psychopath for killing an entire hospital's worth of people, but I also can't argue that they shot first, and I also can't really say I don't understand. At a modest 5 foot 4, I very much doubt I could ever clear a hospital of people, but I at least, after everything I've seen, can understand why he did it. During one of the flashbacks in Ellie's section, she is shown returning to the hospital she was originally supposed to be killed in, running straight to her own operating room with Joel behind her, opening a particularly placed abandoned duffel bag that no looter ever thought to pick up themselves, and finding the recording of the exact moment she died, kept on tape, with all of the exposition of her death spoken out loud for her to hear. So she hears it, and she's upset, and Joel looks like a sad dog. Dog, it's just so ham-fisted. The Last of Us 2 just never finds the original's level of moral ambiguity. With the death of Mel, so begins Abby's segment. Contrary to all the negativity I paid Ellie in her bonus story, Abby's segment to me was just so much better. I actually really liked her and much of the story around her, so let's actually pay the game some compliments now. In fact, if they ever wanted to release a director's cut with just Abby's segment, with Ellie being a hidden angry villain hunting her until the final confrontation, when her identity is actually revealed, and the 
mystery man you killed in the prologue was actually Joel, I reckon that would be so much more interesting and maybe a bit of a surprising twist on the basis I've had all of my memories of the full game removed. So we start Abby's section with a fat walk and talk chapter where we learn more about what a benevolent, jolly and kind man her father was. Abby's central story seems her torn between her allegiance to the WLF, which I'll be calling wolves from now on to save the syllables, her affection for Owen, her ex-boyfriend, and her new affiliation with Lev and his sister. She's a very normal woman, someone you can kind of imagine in your friendship group or at work. She's a little dry humoured, fairly chatty, happy to earn her keep, dedicated. She has hobbies, fears, quirks. She made me laugh a good few times, I really liked her. It was fairly interesting seeing her struggle between all those parts of herself as well, but it also falls a bit flat towards the end of the game when she throws caution to the wind and just starts wantonly murdering the Seraphs and her own faction without a care in the world. She could have known any number of those people personally or even just been acquainted with them, but it all goes to shit and she's popping people left and right without giving a shit. In fact, Abby's allegiance to the wolves is so weird. We meet Isaac early on, the leader of said faction, and he basically seems to be a symbol for every civilization based on its military. Internally efficient, but externally cold and aggressive, shoot first, ask questions later, strictly follow rules, no exceptions, with many of the internal members acting as pawns, fighting for causes they don't even know are in the crosshair. Isaac, like many other things in this game, is fairly nothingy. He's cold and bureaucratic, able to make tough decisions for the good of the many, but usually at the detriment of the few people we give a shit about. But still, he's fairly inoffensive and underdeveloped. He never really does anything besides just act as the rule expositor for the wolf's faction, and he dies in a way I didn't even realise until I was reading about him later on the wiki page. But that's fine, because we have bigger fish to fry. See, Abby is worried about Owen, her ex-partner. He's moved on, found someone new, and lives remotely in the very aquarium Ellie goes on to murder him in. But suspicious shit is afoot, and she wants to make sure he's okay, so she heads out to find him, meeting Mel on the way. I have to say, I did appreciate the awkward back and forth between Mel and Abby. As a comparison to Jesse and Ellie, whose pain should be far fresher and whose conversation should be ten times more awkward, it sounded like a much more realistic conversation to have. Alice gets shotgun. Mel's pregnant. She could use the fresh air. Give you two a chance to talk. Real soon, eh? Gracias. Have you been sleeping these days? Definitely the kind of interchange one might expect between an ex and a current partner. Speaking of realistic, I also quite liked Owen's characterization. He is a cunt. He is not a nice person by any means, and he's definitely not someone you would ever want to know. He runs from his problems, and he gets cold feet, and I think we can all relate to that. He bails on Abby, he bails on the wolves, and he bails on his nine-month pregnant missus when she is about to pop out a baby, and he plans to bail away on a little boat to Santa Barbara. He is a man of cold feet, a child an immature dickhead, a jilter, and I felt like he was probably one of the most convincingly written characters in the game. Like Henry and Sam from the original title, he doesn't do things for everybody's betterment, he's selfish, he works for himself, but you know, you can't really judge him for that. I mean, you can judge him if you want to, but like, it's a different situation, isn't it? The first time Abby finds him, he's fine. There's a little bow and arrow minigame, some cutesy awkward back and forth, and Abby's back on the road again. Back on the road to my favourite character. You see, Abby's story centres so much more firmly on the Sarah fights than Ellie's does, and thus does her relationship with Lev begin. I love Lev, he is my favourite character, and I especially love how his relationship with Abby begins to really grow. It's the closest Bond seen since Ellie and Joel, and even then it's still in its infancy by the end of the game. That to me highlights just how shallow this game's relationships are, but still it's really nice. Some of their dialogue was cute, and I remember laughing quite a few times at some of their exchanges. I heard a lot of uproar about the wokeness of having a transgender character in the game, but really, I mean, this is a cis person's opinion, so feel free to skip ahead by 60 seconds if you're not interested in hearing it, but I feel like Lev was handled really well. He doesn't feel like a token character, there's no big coming out or no voyeuristic shower scene or any spitefully natured portrayal. I mean, imagine if David Cage wrote him, imagine what he would have done. But Lev has been written by some fairly responsible writers, and as a result he is just a little boy running away from his sister. In fact, his dead name and assigned gender only crop up once during one segment in an office 
where Seraphs are pursuing the both of you. And I remember speaking to Twitch chat at the time, so on my first playthrough I actually missed this bit of context. Later in the story he offers to tell Abby more, and Abby says, you know, it's okay, she doesn't need to hear it. And they just kind of leave it at that. It's not overly gratuitous, it doesn't put him on a pedestal, it doesn't fetishise him, it's just Lev. And I thought that that was good, and it to me it felt healthy, but like I said, cis person's opinion. One of my favourite things about Lev is his simultaneous balancing of naivety and wisdom. It's really strange, but incredibly charming. He doesn't know what cool means, it has to be explained to him, but he approaches and explains the concept of fear in such a calm, collected way. He assesses Abby's way of life and responds maturely when she insults his, and yet he's got zero ability to read the room, and he asks Abby awkward conversations about her love life while she's scaling a crane hundreds of feet above the ground. What's going on between you and your friend Owen? Oh my god, Lev, now? It seemed really awkward. Just go! I stand Lev. With Lev's sister hurt, Abby needs to now make it back to Owen and her collection of awesome visuals begins. One of my favourite scenes in the game is Abby's traversal under the pier, with these big jagged rocks and sharpened pikes of broken wood sticking out of the water like teeth. It's a really hostile scene visually, and it's hard to describe but it's a scene that makes me feel dread. I love it, I wish more of the game looked like that. With Lev's sister on the absolute brink of logging out for good, the two of them need to form an unlikely pair, and Abby needs to trust Lev's guidance across the city quickly rather than passing other hostile factions and floodwaters down in the streets, which would take much longer and would be much more dangerous. Comparing this directly to The First Last of Us, this is the closest we come to finding that relationship that was built between Joel and Ellie, but Abby and Lev start on such a back foot that they have no hope of ever catching up. Joel and Ellie start their journey somewhat neutrally and have an entire 12 hours to build a rapport, a respect and a genuine bond. Lev and Abby start as enemies and have about 5 hours to build the same, meaning they end up nowhere near in the same boat, but I I appreciate the attempt regardless, it's definitely the beginnings of something. Their journey takes them to the hospital, looking for antibiotics for Lev's sister. God, it's always about Lev's fucking sister, isn't it? Some people just have to be the centre of the universe, but who's waiting for them down in the hospital? Well, in the bowels of the hospital, we learn why all the other infected in the game seem to have been nerfed so hard. The Rat King. The Rat King is a very cool bit of lore. He's patient zero, yet another glimmer of a story that would have been 20 times more interesting to play, but we're here now and we need to make the best of it. He's basically a quick bloater with a scrawny sidekick, chasing you around a tight set of corridors and rooms. He's able to smash through pillars and walls and tables you use to keep your distance, and close the space between the two of you in a moment. It's exciting, if only the bloater fights were as scary as they were in the first game. The issue with the Rat King is that they seem to have nerfed the bloaters five ways to Sunday just to make the Rat King seem like a threat in comparison. I remember in the original game, bloaters were a terrifying force of nature. You weren't even sure if it was possible to kill them at first, even when you learn they are a careful balance of resource management and skill, and even then it's risky to engage them. Sure, once you realise how weak they are after a Molotov, you can kind of work around them in your own way, but at first they are terrifying. The Rat King is the only boss in the game and he's fairly fun. The build up towards his fight is very tense, and his final reveal is a big panic moment. His pacing is fantastically done, and just another reason why Abby could probably have held this game up by herself, in my humble opinion. With Abby, we evade a sniper, sneak through a Seraphite war, escape with Lev, and confront Ellie. As Abby caves in Ellie's head, the credits roll. Actually, nah, just kidding, there are probably about six more hours to go, starting with the farm. The farm denotes the beginning of our final sprint through the game, in a way that feels kind of like an epilogue, except it's absolutely not. To say tacked on would give donkey-based party games too much respect. Essentially, we play a very on-rails fat-walking segment where Ellie walks around with her new baby, baby Jesse Joel, if I didn't mention that ridiculous name before. It's so strange, but okay. And she lives a cute, idyllic, peaceful life for a while, and dances to me music and take some sheep into a barn. She has a tickle of mild PTSD when the door slams shut and suffers an episode Dina has to yank her out of, and then, because there always has to be a then, Tommy shows up, heavily disabled from being shot in the head by Abby, and tells Ellie that he knows where Abby is now. Dina very specifically says to Ellie, if you go, we will not be here when you get back. And Ellie goes. It frustrates me. As I said way back at the start of this review, this story completely divides the audience into a camp that backs Ellie, and a camp that thinks she's a bloodthirsty moron, and if you've been in that second camp this whole time, like I was, you have so little patience by the time this segment comes around. Not a shred of sympathy left. Sorry Ellie, I didn't back you when you hunted Nora like an animal and murdered her. I didn't back you when you burst into an aquarium and held a couple at gunpoint. I did back you when you slit that guy's throat in the elementary school because that 
genuinely was self-defense, but you were on a journey for revenge at that point, so I'd have rather you just stayed home. Either way, I certainly don't back you now, and for me at this point, Ellie's motivations were nothing short of eye-rolling. Naturally, with her past behind her and her current idyllic life on a knife's edge, she leaves. We learn during a short segment with Abby and Lev that they've been captured by some nasty faction called the Rattlers, but we don't truly learn how bad their situation is until Ellie stumbles upon them herself. Abby and Lev were taken by the aforementioned Rattlers, an infinitely more interesting faction than the Wolves or anything we really saw throughout the main game. For some reason, sandwiched in right at the end of this, with no build-up or impact. Why not use a splinter group from the Wolves or Seraph faction that have been hunting them this whole time? Why bring a whole new faction in? I mean, the Rattlers are super interesting, but they're also completely unearned narratively. It's so puzzling as to why the game keeps pulling random plot points out of its arse that actually would have been a much more interesting concept if included earlier in the game. They were an extremely oppressive faction. We see a moment where our runaway slave would rather commit suicide than go back, awkward considering we burn the place down and free all the slaves when we arrive, meaning if he'd waited a bit longer he probably could have left with the rest of them, but you know, let's not tell him that. Their base is very visually striking, that beautiful Santa Barbara mansion, their code of ethics is horrifying, meaning Ellie and Abby could have been facing a very ethically vile group of people for far longer during their journey. The kind of people who will make you wish you could die if they ever got their hands on you. That's scary, you know, that's stakes. None of this whingy pregnant murder spree bullshit. The same goes for the Seraphites, whose system of whistling to communicate is beautifully executed and actually very comprehensively developed. If you have subtitles on, it even tells you what they're saying as they identify you and move in, telling the others to group up, flank you and overwhelm you. Their culture, besides the transphobia obviously, is interesting and their island home is genuinely beautiful. They are hunters who have become accustomed to post-apocalyptic life, living physically comfortably but ideologically problematically. But still, they're a really curious piece of lore that basically serves as different factions to kill, rather than offer any proper impact on the plot. You could replace them with a bunch of bigoted wolf members and it would be no different. The Rattlers and the Seraphs are certainly far more interesting than the wolf faction anyway, being that they're different in every way, ethically reproachable and a mystery to us. There's so much to learn from either faction that it would have made for an amazing story, but instead we get slugged with the wolves for most of the game so we can sit and wait in line for burritos and sit in the back of cars and stuff, it's just boring. Ellie works her way over to Santa Barbara and heads through an old derelict neighbourhood, coming into contact with the Rattlers herself before eventually stumbling upon their base. It's a compound full of slaves and chained infected used as guard dogs. You see a few runaways get domed, presumably to highlight very quickly just how evil the Rattlers are, since we now only have two chapters to drive the message home and then infiltrate the base. It's a really short segment. We stealth past a few, inevitably break cover, then shoot through the rest on the way to finding Abby and Lev. Ellie frees a bunch of slaves, not because she gives a shit about them obviously, but because she's looking for Abby and Lev and finds out that they tried to escape and so they've been hung out the back like beef jerky. No mither, Ellie says, and wanders out into the garden to see if she can find them. Now, the scene where Ellie finds them is fairly striking. Rotten, half-eaten corpses are hanging from pikes in the ocean, cooking in the sun. It probably fucking reeks. You have to sift through them to find Abby, which might take longer than you think considering she's missing her ponytail, and get her down. She says thanks, tiredly, and tries to walk away, and you kind of wish you could leave it there, but the game doesn't give you any option besides limply chasing after her and trying to smack her. She turns around and looks at you like she's so fucking tired of your shit, and honestly, Abby, I was right there with you. Ellie just comes off pathetic in this. It's really cringe and really annoying to see her go halfway across the country just to shove an emaciated woman, and if I was shaking my head before, I was giving myself whiplash now. It's stupid. I guess it's supposed to drive home the futility of your actions after a game's worth of bloodthirsty pursuit, but I hadn't had a game's worth of bloodthirsty pursuit. I had a game's worth of I own this game and I'd like to feel like I've experienced all the content and had a worthwhile time with it, so I just didn't have that dawning realisation of futility. I just felt like I'd never been playing as Ellie in the first place. Long story short, she gets back to the farm with a few less fingers and a few less family members and sits to pluck out the one fucking song Joel seems to have ever have taken the time to teach her and I was completely emotionally checked out. Oh, what a clever moment, sort of, if it had been done better, sure. You see, let me tell you a story. Druckmann originally planned The Last of Us 1 to have this story with a couple of alterations. Drucker's original intention was to have Tess as the main villain chasing Joel across the country for murderous revenge, but nobody could get behind it. No one could see why somebody would go to all that trouble to cross a country to get revenge on somebody who was actively trying to get away from you. Evan Wells, the original co-writer, encouraged Druckmann to reassess and guided his process to produce The Last of Us 1, one of the most successful games of the generation. But Evan Wells was gone for The Last of Us 2, and the last bastion of good writing seems to have gone with him, because now Druckers had full control over this game and he finally wrote the story he wanted to write over a decade ago, and it was shit. Not only was it the dumpster fire it would have been on release of the first game, but the dumpster fire it is now, now that Druckers was able to write a story that died 
died in the room over 10 years ago, and he had to retcon 50 characters and contort several plot points just to get it to work. That's why it was shit, because it's not the logical story that the sequel would take, it's an absolutely contorted, forced story, flooding the shoes of characters it was never meant to fill, satisfying one man's desperate ego quest to force through a story he was politely told wasn't a very good idea more than 10 years ago. You'll have no doubt noticed by now that I've very thoroughly omitted Joel from the discussion so far, and A, it's because I'm on page 19 of my script and I don't want to pad this thing worse than the game I'm discussing, and B, it's because he is barely present. Sure, he's in cutscenes and flashbacks, but our man Joel becomes one thing he never should have become in The Last of Us 2. He becomes an object. Joel is our MacGuffin, he's our plot device, he's our damsel in distress, our girlfriend in the fridge. In the first game, he was an actor. He acted upon the world around him, and the consequences of his actions had meaning. In the second game, he's an object. He is acted upon, and bears the consequences of other people's actions. Abby brains him, present day Ellie shouts at him, past Ellie leads him. He looks sad, he looks proud, he says a few shit lines, but he's not Joel. I replayed The Last of Us while writing this review, and was just so immediately struck by the difference between old Joel and this Joel. I mean, I, I know that people can change over time, I'm not saying that, you know, he becomes a lot softer in The Last of Us 2, but I don't feel like growing softer with age is something that is impossible, but old Joel was a man out to do a job, suffering from the loss of Sarah and Tess, and witnessing a struggle everywhere. He had to keep a girl alive, not just out of obligation, but also out of a genuine need to nurture. He had a soft side, he wasn't some roid ridden marine, he was a father, and his story was all about that paternal love in a horrible post-apocalypse. It was a story of a growing bond, something beautiful after the world has long since ended. Yeah, yeah, Joel did flourish in a time when putting a woman on the front of a video game box was career suicide, but he stood out from hordes of roided up grizzly men by being a roided up grizzly man with a soul. Even in the subtle moments when Joel crouches next to an object, he'll brace himself against it with his hand, and Ellie will tuck in under his arm to be safe, and the two of them peer out of cover together. It's been 10 years and I still lose my mind with how sweet that is, just that one gesture. In The Last of Us 2, he is a mopey beaten dog. He is a lonely, sad old bachelor who clings to Ellie years after she's rejected him in a way that comes off creepy. People can change, sure, but he's obviously been changed specifically to fit the mould and be the character Ellie would want to avenge, so it comes off as unnatural. There's one scene involving a dance in a barn that's really pretty, and it's the moment we see the kiss between Ellie and Dina that sparked the bigot in the very first scene. Well, you know, he's back. He comes in to act out the role of the biggest middle-aged white straw man in video game history, making a public homophobic scene in front of a crowd of horrified onlookers. He gets aggressive, because it's time for Joel to prove he still cares, and the aforementioned Texan steps in and pushes him, playing the role of the angry father figure. He shoves this guy and there's like an awkward high school prom moment where everyone looks at him. I don't really know what the message of this moment is supposed to be, but Ellie scolds him and scuttles off like a battered dog. I don't think there's a scene in that game where he's not crying his eyes out. Get the hell out of here. Get your hands off me. Hey! Enough. Go on, you. Let's go for a walk. What about them? You worry about yourself. Let's get you some fresh air. You are a kiddo. What is wrong with you? He had no right. And you do? I don't need your fucking help, Joel. Right. I think a better example of this kind of parental bittersweetness is in Breaking Bad towards the end of the series, when Walt is alone. He goes to negotiate with his ex-wife Skylar, and his last ever vision of his son, the last time he ever, ever sees his boy, is when Walt is watching from his car as Walt Jr. is walking home from school. It is the most subtle but bittersweet moment of a father silently watching his son, knowing he will never speak to him again, knowing that his son hates him for making choices he believes were for the best. It's a perfect parallel to Joel and Ellie. It's quiet and it's quick, but it's heartbreaking. I feel like that's the same feeling the writers go for with Joel, but it's too dramatic and too silly to ever be a quiet, sad moment of loss. They just don't trust you as the player to be able to consume those moments. They need to emblazon it in front of you. They need to absolutely absolutely stamp at your forehead, they don't trust you to be able to watch a quiet, subtle scene and understand what's going on. So instead we get these stupid, like, overdramatic scenes instead, where he looks like a battered dog and Ellie shouts at him. On the topic of Ellie, her transition from the first game comes off as hugely inorganic. At the crescendo of The Last of Us, she acts out of self-defence and the defence of the people she cares about. Her actions are rooted in love. In The Last of Us 2, she is hatred embodied. She goes against everything she's ever stood for and starts actively murdering 
murdering people with so little motivation she barely needs a kick to get started. She seeks people out and murders them in a situation the game has somehow contorted into self-defense and then cries about it like she never intended it to happen that way. Ellie, you hunted somebody halfway across the country and held their friends at gunpoint. You have to imagine that this was on the cards. She's written now as a hot-headed moron and any affection I had for her character had long since evaporated by the end of the game. This was such an unnecessarily disrespectful story both for her and Joel as we watch a genuine Bond get flushed down the toilet in favour of shocking scenes and Oscar bait bullshit. In some interviews I remember hearing that Druckmann wanted Ellie to be a drug addict who couldn't kick the drug of revenge. At what point is it ever shown to be like a drug for her? She is PTSD ridden, she's never enjoying it, she never has a high from it. This isn't doom eternal, she's always worse for wear every time she kills somebody. There's never a point where we see her relishing in it, and if she was relishing in it why don't we see that? It's such a weird projection on his part how he somehow finds this reasonable, something that people watching will relate to. It's so telling about Druckmann himself and his own projections of what a daughter out of revenge would look like, the idea that this revenge addict could ever be relatable to the average player is just absurd. In part one Ellie is willing to give her life to see the goal out, the collective goal of humanity. Why is a selfless person like this now obsessed with ruining the lives of everyone who comes into contact with her negatively? I see her beef with Abby, fine that's legit, but she makes a list of all of Abby's accomplices and ticks them off one by one, who does that? I remember in the final scene of the first game she looks at Joel and says, with everything we've done it can't be for nothing. It was poignant, this idea that yes, largely their whole journey did come to nothing. Their ideals of saving humanity were nowhere in the end, that's fair, but it was a story of real love between a parent and a child and a horrible dystopia. Their journey came to nothing, but there was so much of that had been built between them that you couldn't possibly argue there truly was nothing by the end. Yet in part two we see her go through everything only to set Abby free at the end and lose everything. It is really for nothing, which could be an interesting take I suppose, but I honestly don't believe that this was the writer's intention to strike this parallel between the first and the second game. Why have we given these two characters each other only to just spend a game ripping them away from one another, just stamping on your toys in front of you and telling you you're supposed to be annoyed because that's the point of the story and therefore you can't criticise it for annoying you? What was the message here? Ellie goes on a 14 hour revenge binge for the death of a character she's openly vilified and hated for the last five years. She's rejected him ever since she heard that carefully placed recording. And yet as soon as he's dead she murders people for him, this poor miserable old sack of shit who she's actively bullied away from her for years, as though avenging his death is something that will help. But surely the message should be, if anything, not to bully those people in the first place, to forgive, to let bygones be bygones, but he killed people for her. To not ignore someone for half a decade and then suddenly be sad when they die? I mean, he prevented humanity finding a cure, but he could have clocked it at any second during those five years and suddenly she now gives a shit. It was too contradictory. I understand why she's annoyed at him, but I don't understand why she feels justified in killing him for him after he dies. Their relationship is too fractured from what we see, but all of a sudden she goes cross-country murder spree for him? I don't believe that was the intended message either. I mean, for anybody ready to say, oh that's the whole point, to be thankful for the time you have together, because it's certainly not the message that they drive home with Abby and her dad, or Abby and Owen, or Owen and Mel, or Lev and his sister, or Ellie and Dina, or Dina and Jesse. It was just a domino line of deaths with bullshit levity. Joel did a bad thing, sure, but fucking hell Ellie, put it behind you, or don't be upset enough when he dies that you kill a football stadium's worth of people. Pick your side, you know, come to terms with your feelings or fuck off. I genuinely don't believe that this game was held up to be a mirror to Ellie's characterization in the first game either, but rather some weird depressing story where they flexed their writing muscles and just tried to be generally upsetting. Because most importantly, we never understand how Ellie went from being a selfless and accepting person to becoming a person consumed with revenge and hate. There is just not enough there for that to be believable. It's not something we see with Tommy either, whose character gets assassinated assassinated. Not even just between the two games, but also between the start and the end of The Last of Us 2. Tommy, a loving family man and a happy brother, goes out by himself for a lone wolf thing, obsessed with revenge. He loses an eye, his mobility and a wife, although that last one wasn't much of a loss, she was a bitch but still. What's more is that Tommy and Ellie repeatedly split up despite having the same goals and both go on parallel journeys. I have no idea why they did that, I guess he's the parallel to Ellie and he's there to teach her a lesson, but that's not a lesson we see thematically and it's not one that Ellie learns, so it doesn't matter. The moment he snipes Manny is really cool, the visual where he's walking aiming down the sight in game, that's sick, but it was done in the first game, in that terrifying sequence where you need to skip past the sniper in the cul-de-sac. Everything in this game is just straight reused from part one, so you can't really give anything credit. Every time something good happens you have to ask, is it an homage, is it an unintentional copy paste, or a straight up reused concept? What a fine line to walk, Naughty Dog. I feel like this game just says, you know what'll be sad? If we just break your toys, 
series and then sits back and watches you go through the motions of watching beloved existing characters do wildly dumb things for the sake of pushing a half-baked plot forward. The new characters were pretty sound though. The best characterization and consequently the best parallels I saw between characters were between Abby and Liv. I loved the way those two bounced off each other and I especially loved the way their ways of life were alien to each other but also shockingly similar. There's a moment where Abby makes judgement of Lev for being a child soldier, not realising she herself kind of is one. I guess it's easy to see a child soldier as a kid with a rifle, but there are loads of units in the military and Abby is trained as a field medic herself, so in a way, she kind of was raised as a child soldier. Just a different kind, one in a more modern, recognisable military system that we assume to be for the betterment of the people within, rather than an alien concept of distant island-based cults like the Seraphites. Moreover, she's trapped in the wolf system too and has been since the end of The Last of Us 1, technically, so in a way, she herself has been groomed to be part of a military operation she has no idea the true extent of. She is in a faction to meet her ends, of course, to eat and live and be safe, but by contributing to the faction she is furthering their ends too, wiping out other factions with whom she has no beef. I thought that was clever, those subtle parallels, and I really liked them, I thought they were done very well. Still, I've seen a lot of people say they appreciate this game because it tried new things, and it didn't pander, and it didn't do what people wanted, and it wasn't a happy ending, but I think it's easy to confuse respect with appreciation and and quality. Personally, I don't think pushing the mould, retconning tons of characters was something I respected or appreciated, and I don't think it necessarily reflected a quality back to me. I just kind of finished the game wishing it hadn't been made in the first place. So, just looking at the script, I know this is going to be one of the longest videos I've ever made, but I promise I really tried to keep this short, I really, really trimmed this down. Essentially, my feelings boil down to one thing, I don't think this game needed to exist. Personally, I found a lot of closure with the ending of The Last of Us. It sat with me for a really long time, until one day I decided that Joel and Ellie moved on with their lives and they lived to be old and the world kept spinning. And yeah, sure it wasn't exactly realistic, but it kept me from going over it in my mind because I just couldn't stop thinking about it. Between that closure and Druckmann's desperate attempt to contort out a controversial experience from an idea he had over a decade ago that was rejected by someone smarter and more talented than him, I will admit I was biased against the sequel from the start, but that doesn't mean that there'd have been a sequel I'd have been unhappy to see. And I also don't want you to think that I necessarily dislike Druckmann as a person. He has gotten a lot of unnecessary hate for this game and he definitely didn't deserve a lot of the abuse he received at all. I don't think that he should have been bullied in any capacity for what he wrote. I just don't think what he wrote was very good. Like, nothing against him as a man, but you know, as, in terms of his craft, I just think it was a bit trash. This game just caved in the head of one of the most impactful characters of my childhood and then looked at how annoyed I was and condescendingly said, that's the point. You're supposed to be annoyed. If you're annoyed, then I've succeeded and therefore you can't criticise me because it was completely intentional that you felt this way. I've seen a lot of people say, of course he died for nothing, that's just how people die, and I agree. In terms of a death, getting smashed in the head with a golf club is just as likely an ending for Joel as dying in his sleep. People die for nothing all the time. But he didn't die for nothing. He died for controversy at the hands of a writing team that wanted to see how depressing they could write a story and whether or not they could get people on Abby's side in the aftermath. The Last of Us 1 is a story about love, Druckers once said in an interview, but The Last of Us 2 is a story about hate. Yeah, well I guess that is valid since that's pretty much how I felt about both instalment respectively. Thanks Druckman. And thank you for watching my review. If you enjoyed it, please like, subscribe, subscribe, comment, I'd love to hear your thoughts about this. Again, these are my own opinions. Please don't be too nasty about it. By and large, I, I hope you enjoyed the video. It means a lot to me if you stuck it out this far and I really appreciate anybody who's still listening now. If you want to see me play games in real time, check me out on Twitch, which will be linked in the description below, and have a really good day. I'll see you guys later on and thank you again for watching. What is the downside to eating a clock? It's time consuming. That's so dumb. <laughs> yeah.